Today we are going to be planting a large portion of the spring garden. So in a recent video, I walked around and I talked about my rough plans. We're gonna see if I follow them today because I don't remember everything I said, but I'm pretty sure I have a good idea of where I want everything to go. So one of the things we're going to be doing first is putting in some potatoes. I have the Corolla variety, which is a yellow potato. And then I have the Sarpomira, which is a yellow fleshed potato, but is pink on the outside. This one is very prolific and very delicious. So I'm very much looking forward to getting a potato harvest. Now, some people wonder if it is too late to start potatoes. Here where I am in San Diego, we're probably going to get about two to three months of coastal sort of mugginess, uh, gloom, if you will and the temps are probably not gonna go much over 70 degrees. So for me, that's perfect potato weather. The tomatoes that we're going to put in today, maybe won't like it as much, but they're gonna have to deal with it because that's what they're gonna get. So let's get started. I did do the irrigation back here in the raised beds and I'd love to put some potatoes in there so I don't have to think about them. So let's start over there. So here's the bed we're going to be putting in some of the potatoes at least. And this is a two by four short, small birdies bed. Pretty nice size. I've always wanted to try growing potatoes in a raised bed and I've just never had the space for it. So what I'm going to do here is give them plenty of space because I want to actually get a decent amount of potatoes. I want big potatoes, not just a return on my potatoes. I want at least 10 times the potatoes I put in. So I'm going to choose a couple of good ones here. I'm not going to be cutting these. I'm going to be leaving them as is. So there's three of my Sarpomiras. Each one of these has chitted by the way, which means that they have little sprouts emerging. And the way I'm gonna be planting this potato is just burying it deeply so I don't have to bother hilling it later on. Now let's take a look at the Corolla. I got a smaller amount of these because this is a new variety to me. I don't know if I quite like it, but it sounds very delicious in the description. I'm gonna do three of those over here as well. So what I'm going to do now is come over here, grab my trowel, and I'm going to be spacing them about a foot apart. So in this bed, I'm not trying to get too many potatoes. Like I said, I want large potatoes, not just potatoes in general. Oh boy. Plenty of grubs though. Don't want the raccoons finding these. Recently got hit by raccoons pretty hard on <laughs> the other side of my raised bed over there. So let's go pretty deep here. This trowel is six inches. So I'm actually right at six inches down here. I'm gonna go ahead and just drop this potato right in. So the top of the potato is about five inches deep. I'm gonna bury it. That's where one potato is. Come in about a foot here. Let's get these potatoes in the ground. So that's three Sarpomiras, and I'm gonna go in with three of the Corollas here. You could probably put more potatoes in this bed than I'm doing, but I've never tried actually giving them enough space. And this year, I'm just very curious to see how much of an impact that'll have. So we're gonna go with as much space as I could feel comfortable giving them basically. So I have six potatoes in this bed now and the middle row doesn't have anything planted. So once we get into the seedling starts I have in my greenhouse, we'll see what I have left that would make sense to add in here because I'm definitely not just going to leave this with potatoes. I don't think I've ever planted a single bed in my life with just one thing and I'm not trying to start today. So we're gonna come back to this, but first let's find somewhere else to sneak a couple potatoes. Let's go ahead and throw some potatoes into these containers. For context, this is just a random assortment of leftover soil from previous grows that I did over the winter. Some of the soil is dry, some of it is a little hydrated. All I did is I blended together a couple different grow bags and called it a day. With potatoes, they don't need that much in terms of nutrients. They're considered a pioneer crop. That doesn't mean that they won't benefit from nutrients, but they don't necessarily need them. So what I'm going to do here is I scooped out some of the old potting mix. That's what you see over here. And then on this side is fresh compost. This has been unused, just ready to go compost. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to blend together the old potting mix with this fresh compost. And that's what we're going to use to top these potatoes. As for what's inside these bags, well, there's nothing but old used potting mix. So that's it. That's how we're gonna start. Now I haven't had good success in the past growing potatoes in grow bags. They always grew, but I never really felt like I got enough potatoes back for it to be worth the effort. That's why we're trying the raised bed this time. But the only thing I'm doing different here compared to previous times is that I'm using one of our lined grow bags. This will help retain a little bit more moisture, at least in this upper area. And I'll see if that makes any impact on actual yield. Cause like I said, I've always got potatoes, but I've never got enough to actually feel like it was worth it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to choose two smaller potatoes. So these are like maybe a little bit smaller than an egg. I'm going to take them and bury them until they're about two inches away from the bottom of the grow bag. And then I'm going to fill this bag of soil back up. So for the other one, the Corolla, actually I only have 
two potatoes left, so that's perfect. Whatever they are, that's what's gonna go in. Same idea here. I'm just pushing them into this layer of soil. So here's the potato and the soil is filled up so that it's about, I don't know, four to six inches filled from the bottom. So what I'm going to do is take my potato here and then I'm going to just make a little cavity, drop the potato in until it's about two inches from the floor and then cover it up with soil and that's it. Now I'm not gonna bother hilling these potatoes, meaning progressively adding soil. What I'm going to do instead is just go ahead and entirely backfill this bag. I'm going to just see if that's possible. I know that it's worked in the past. I just don't wanna bother coming back here and hilling it all the time. I guess for insurance, I'll leave the top two inches unfilled. But other than that, we are filling these bags from the get-go. The idea is that it'll take a little bit longer for that potato to reach the surface, but along the way, it'll now have plenty of opportunity to set potatoes. So. Let's go ahead and backfill. The logic behind this move is that potatoes don't actually need all that soil in order to produce. They have plenty of soil already as it is. What the straw is going to do is a couple things. First of all, it's going to lock in a lot of moisture, keeping these potatoes happy. Second of all, it's not gonna get as hot now because it's going to have a thick layer of straw on top and potatoes don't like the heat. And thirdly, it's going to make sure the potatoes are still covered from sunlight so they don't turn green but the potato could easily push through this and grow just fine. So this is place a potato about two to four inches from the bottom, backfill with soil, and then the last two inches, I'm adding just straight up mulch. This could be any mulch you have on hand. I happen to have straw. So that's what we're going with. So we'll check back on this, I guess in like three months and see if this was worth it. And then we'll be able to actually compare it <laughs> to the raised beds. And maybe I'll only be growing potatoes in raised beds from now on. So. That's it for potatoes today. Let's go ahead and move on to the next plant. So over here, I have a selection of flowers that I've been potting on for a while. And looks like I have two queenie lime orange zinnias. Those are some of my favorites. I think two zinnias will actually fill out that bed quite nicely with the potatoes. So I think I'm gonna grab that and anything else in here. All these other plants are honestly a little bit too big. They might outcompete those potatoes. So let's go ahead and pop these zinnias in. On the way out here, I actually saw this nasturtium start, which is quite large and definitely needs to go in the ground. So let's go ahead and add a little spiller here. Not because I don't have enough nasturtiums already, but <laughs> because I actually really like them. And uh, I'm not gonna let this one go to waste. So that's gonna be a corner one, because that's going to spill over the bed, cascade down into the garden. Now for the two zinnias, we're gonna go ahead and space these out evenly on this bed. So I'm gonna put one on the far end here add some nice color contrast up against this wall, the cinder block wall, which is very ugly. So there's one. And then the other guy, I think I'm gonna just go ahead and put it right in the middle. I already have the nasturtium on the end there. So having a nice little flower right in the middle, I don't actually mind that. Now when it comes to growing zinnias, you can actually top them, which means that you just simply take the top like this pinch it off and now what's going to happen is that zinnia is going to branch. So I'm gonna do that to this side as well here. Drop them to about the same height. So here's the portion we just removed. So you can see the two leaves here. What's going to happen now is every time there's two leaves up against the stem, that is where new growth comes out. So by doing this, instead of having a single stalk come up and then flower, we're now going to start with at least two stalks that are going to produce more flowers. That's going to make a bushier, lower zinnia with more flowers overall, rather than a super tall one that just produces one big flower and then starts producing more later. We're gonna start off with at least two flowers at the beginning and they're gonna be lowered to the ground and give us a bushier effect. So that is one of the effects of pinching your flowers. Zinnias is one of the few flowers I bother doing that with. There are others that benefit, but zinnias I always think are really nice when you pinch them at least once at the beginning. Next to that short bed where we put the potatoes is my tall four by four bed. I'm trying to figure out what to put in there. I don't wanna to put tomatoes cause it's too tall of a bed already. And my peppers, well, they're not quite ready yet. They're actually pretty small. Here's an example of what they look like. It's a little early to put these guys out, but they will be potted up today. So what I'm thinking is I have a couple basil plants that are ready to go. I also have these lemon sun patty pan squash. These are like the little yellow patty pans, the little UFO shaped ones. And I have some of this jewel amethyst eggplant. This is an eggplant that produces these little baby eggplants. I think the plant itself also doesn't get that big. So I'm just kind of curious to try what would happen if I put eggplant out this early. It's a little bit earlier than usual. Eggplant is a heat loving crop, but I have the space for it. I don't have anything else to put there right now. as far unless I'm blanking on something. So let's go ahead and plant this out and I'll show you how I space these guys out. So here is the four by four tall birdies bed. And what we're going to do, like I said, is put some of this lemon patty pan squash 
a couple basils, I have a purple and a green, and three of these jewel amethyst eggplants. So the first thing I wanna do is actually try to think through a little bit how I wanna actually lay this out. I'm thinking the patty pan squashes are gonna go on this side because I want the eggplant to get as much heat as possible, which is this side, which is facing west where the sun's gonna hit it late in the afternoon. So I'm thinking we'll go one, two, three eggplant, and then we'll do one, two squash, and then put a basil, basil. So let's see what that looks like. The first thing I'm gonna do is pop them out of these cells, do a little laying out, and we'll see what that actually visually looks like. So one right there, one right here, third one right there. One squash, second squash, then green basil is gonna go up front here. My purple basil is gonna go right back there. And so there we have a rough layout. Now these eggplants are going to fill in this area entirely. The basil, if I prune it, similar to actually the zinnia, I could go ahead and pinch this top right here, just like that. Oh my God, that smells so good. And then this will now be a bushier basil plant up front here where I'm definitely gonna be harvesting a lot of basil. I've been looking forward to oh, basil for such a long time. And then over on this side, we'll be getting plenty of squash. Now, important thing is that this is a far bed. So traditionally, I would never put any summer squash out this far away from the kitchen, but it's early in the season. They're not gonna grow that quickly. And honestly, I don't plan on leaving these squash in here for too many months. They're probably gonna get a little bit unruly. So I'm gonna go ahead, pop these all in the ground, and then we're gonna move on to tomatoes my most critical planting because they are my favorite plant. And we have some cleaning up to do, including harvesting some giant cabbages. So I just went back into the greenhouse and I found a couple more plants I want to put in here because this bed seems a little bit lonely. The first one is actually a poppy. This is a dark grape poppy and I am transplanting this. I did start it from seed. I'm saying that because a lot of people tell me that you can't do this, even though I'm literally doing it right now in front of you guys. Here's the poppy plant that I started from seed. The key when you're transplanting it is that you don't want to actually mess with the roots at all, which is why these Epic Six cells are so nice because they train the roots to go straight down and not wrap. So by putting it gently into the ground, just like I did there, it should do totally fine and grow into a beautiful poppy. Now, the other thing I noticed is that I have these bunching onions. These are basically scallions. So what I'm going to do is just loosen these out a little bit, not all the way. I'm not going to separate every single one but I'm gonna plant them in little bunches across any blank space. These are gonna form pretty quickly, much before this uh, eggplant well, for example. So I'm not too worried about that. And they should maybe even help with some pest deterrent because onions are very stinky. Allegedly that helps deter things like aphids, although I haven't had a chance to really see if that's true or not, but I'm willing to try it. So let's go ahead and put these in. Again, I'm not going to be doing anything fancy here. I'm just loosely splitting them up a teeny bit, not even very well, and just putting them in the ground. Then I'll pop them anywhere where I have some free space. So there you go, just like that. I'm gonna roll them, tease a couple apart, like so. Then I'm gonna plant them in little bunches anywhere where I have a drip emitter actually positioned. And if they're not perfectly upright and straight right now as I'm putting them in, I'm not worried about that either because once they establish, they'll upright themselves and follow the sun. So here we go, perfect. So here's what the final planting looks out. Bunching onions scattered across, one basil, two basil. Then we have the one, two, three eggplant, the two squashes right there, and then there's the poppy that I put right dead center in the middle. So we'll see how that goes, but the poppy is going to add a splash of color, and the nasturtium there is gonna to continue to grow and spill and also add color, and then the onions are gonna get harvested out probably at the same time that the eggplant starts producing. And by then I'll have plenty of basil and plenty of squash coming along as well. So let us now shift focus to this area over here where I have my giant cabbages so we could get ready to put some tomatoes in the ground. It's now day two. I got a little distracted dealing with these cabbages yesterday. There's actually one more we have to harvest here before I could actually plant these tomatoes. Some quick context updates. It has been raining on and off all day which is why I had to wait till the end of the day right now to put these tomatoes in. But here's the basic lineup of at least what's going out right here. So the back row is going to be Sun Gold, Sweetie, Gardener Delight, and Granadero, which is a plum. The first three were cherry tomatoes. Those are gonna go in the back row. Cherry tomatoes don't need quite as much sun as something like a slicing tomato. So the slicing tomatoes are gonna go right up here. Once these onions get harvested out, I'm probably going to put actually a new round of tomatoes, slicers, right up front there to capture that glorious sun that comes in through this garden. So I'm gonna get these cherries out of the way first. Now in terms of the slicers that we're putting up here, I have Harvest Moon, that's a new one to me. It's an orange tomato. 
Then I have the Carbon, the Cherokee Carbon, very delicious. It's a hybrid version of Cherokee Purple, Lemon Boy, and Big Beef Plus. Now, the reason why I'm putting these specifically in this bed is that in the past I had Root Knot Nematode, and at least Lemon Boy and Big Beef Plus are nematode resistant. I actually believe Harvest Moon is as well. And then Cherokee Carbon is a hybrid, so we'll see if that gives it any extra benefits. So let's now measure out this section and see how we're gonna deal with these tomatoes. So what I'm going to be using here is the power planter, and that's just gonna help me make these holes a little bit easier. Honestly, I'm quite surprised with how soft the soil is because I have not dug it or done anything to it since I put these cabbages in. So that's a great sign. I'm happy to see that it's actually pretty damp as well, even though I haven't been running irrigation here. So that's just rainwater that's been saved up. So we're gonna go two foot per tomato. So let's go ahead and lay this guy out. All right, now we've got some pretty big holes here. And actually this time I'm not gonna go crazy deep. Now traditionally, most people say that you should go as deep as you possibly can with tomatoes. But when you plant earlier in the season, like I am right now, it's still March, not even April. The soil is warmed up, but even down below, it's not going to be quite as warm as you'd like it. So you do get some benefit from going deep, but going crazy, crazy deep, not so much. So I'm probably gonna bury another, I don't know, two inches on each plant just to get that stem buried and give it nice, good soil contact, which is gonna make it sturdier, holding up to a heavier load of tomatoes. But I'm not gonna go crazy about going too deep. The other reason why is because I am actually going to be amending the hole. Now, the only thing I'm putting in as an amendment this year is neem cake meal. So this is neem cake meal. It's similar to neem oil, but this is the leftover stuff when you press it. It kind of has this interesting aroma of almost like a soy sauce. Now, neem cake meal is closer to a more nitrogen rich fertilizer than I would traditionally like for tomatoes. But the reason why I'm specifically putting some neem fertilizer here because it's been shown to actually decrease nematodes. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about nematodes as I already have, because nematodes have been the bane of my existence when it comes to growing tomatoes. So I'm hoping that by putting this in, I'll at least deter some of the nematode pressure. I'm also going to go ahead and sprinkle some on the surface here. We'll probably bury that in with compost later. Want as much possible protection from nematodes as I could ever possibly get here. We're also gonna be putting in some companion plants specifically French marigolds. French marigolds are the only ones that have been studied to have a large impact on your tomato, or on nematodes, I should say. So let's go ahead and get going. The other thing I'm gonna be adding here is mycos. This is a mycorrhizal inoculant. I'm not affiliated anyway. I am trying it uh, on paper. It should be fantastic. It's a type of mycorrhizal fungi, or well, it is a mycorrhizal fungi, but the way it works is it develops a symbiotic relationship with your tomatoes produces a vast network of the fungal growth underground. That fungal growth taps into your plant's roots and then they exchange nutrients. They also exchange water, for example. So this mycorrhizae, if this tomato is providing it some sugars, it might bring it some water that it needs in order to grow. So it makes plants more resilient. This isn't just like some mumbo jumbo science. This is something that's been actually pretty well understood for quite a few different plants. So the way that it works best is if you go directly on the roots so there we go. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of soil over that neem cake and mix it in. It is an organic fertilizer, meaning that it should break down slowly. But even so, I never feel really good about putting fertilizer right up on the roots. Drop that in, press it in nice and firm. Forgot to mention the first tomato that went in was the Harvest Moon tomato. That's that orange one. This one is Carbon, the Cherokee Purple Hybrid. The next one's going to be Lemon Boy. It's a yellow, hence the name Lemon. And then the last one is going to be the Big Beef plus, which is nematode resistant. All right, that's gonna be the exact same procedure I follow for the cherry tomatoes back there. Same spacing, I'm gonna go four feet from row to row. So four feet from here to the next row where the cherries are, and then two foot per each tomato. That's going to be the exact same. All right guys, now it is time to go in with the heirloom tomatoes. So this is the four by eight short birdies bed. And the reason why I'm doing heirlooms in here is because I've never grown tomatoes in the soil. It is clean soil, should not have any major nematode problem. I am still gonna apply some of this neem cake fertilizer though, just because I'm not taking any chances, that's for sure. So here's the name of the game here. I'm gonna come in a foot from the inside of the corner of the bed here. So one foot, and I'm gonna come actually pretty much only a foot from the edge as well. So on this one, I'm not gonna bother with the drill because it is nice raised bed soil. I don't really need to work it as hard. So I'm gonna do the same basic procedure. I'm gonna get a little scoop here of the neem cake. 
Then I'm gonna blend it into the soil just with my hand here. First tomato is going to be the good old Cherokee purple, my absolute favorite tomato. I'm very excited to see how it performs in a raised bed. We're gonna give it that magic dusting of the mycorrhizal and then pop it right into the ground, just like that. Again, we're not actually going that deep here because it is that early season. In a raised bed, it shouldn't actually matter. I could go as deep as I really want, but these tomatoes aren't that big. So the next one here is Delicious Hunt. This is the one that I grew and I got a over two pound tomato. It was two pounds and three quarters. So pretty big tomato here. I wouldn't say that's necessarily, I like growing it because it is delicious, just like the name implies. Next one is going to be Duster. So Duster is a variety I've been wanting to try for a long time now. I'm apparently very, very delicious. The last tomato of the day here is going to be Italian heirloom. It's been 15 days since I planted all this stuff and went on vacation. So I thought maybe it'd be interesting, instead of just releasing the video of me planting, if I actually did a follow-up after the fact and showed you how all these plants looked, what issues I might have run into, what issues I didn't run into, and just the general state of how these plants are 15 days after transplant. So let's get started in the big bed right over here where I put those tomatoes. All right, first bed over here looks fantastic. No real complaints whatsoever. The tomatoes are growing very, very nicely. They're branching very nicely. They even have this gigantic flower, which I'm definitely not removing. I don't believe in removing the flowers once the season has begun. If it's early season and you're still transplanting, sure, remove the flowers is probably a good idea. But these tomatoes are growing. Who am I to say they can't support those tomatoes? If they couldn't support the tomatoes, they would just drop the flowers on their own. So first update here, less cabbages, but all the tomatoes look fantastic. Now, the real problems are pretty much exclusive to this bed over here where we just put in the random seedlings that I had, including the eggplants. As soon as I left, Apparently this bed got dug out multiple times because I came back and this eggplant was buried three leaves underground because it just got kicked around by raccoons. And uh, yeah, so this hasn't grown much. <laughs> this basically was harassed the entire time. I lost like all my onions. Here's a sad little pile of dried up onions. I think these are the only ones that made it. It looks like there's a couple there. The rest is gone. The squash plant, gone. Not even worth talking about. It was entirely decimated, dug up and destroyed. The basil is hanging in there. It's not looking <laughs> amazing for sure, but it's still alive as is the eggplant. Now, the other thing I did is I sprinkled the entire surface here with chili flakes. And ever since I've done that, they haven't dug in the beds. So I'm happy to say that so far that seems to be working. Over here, likewise, this was dug up. The chili flakes, by the way, was after I came back from vacation. So that's why you see it now. This was dug around a bit and one potato was literally on the surface of the soil. So. I buried it again, it should be fine. But the cool thing here is that we are seeing a lot of growth. All the potatoes have emerged. They're starting to leaf out and I'm hoping to have a wonderful bumper crop of potatoes out of this bed. The flowers basically haven't moved at all, which is kind of weird. I'm not sure if they're getting enough light, especially this one back here might be a little bit buried. But yeah, potatoes are looking good. Not too worried about that. I'm actually pretty happy to see that they are growing. Now over here, we did these in-ground tomatoes. This is my most famous bed for getting dug up by raccoons multiple times. All of these were fully caged before I left and they actually grew so much I had to remove the cage this last week. And uh, just like the tomatoes in-ground, they're actually just about the same size. They look really happy and healthy, really wonderful. They put out a ton of new growth and likewise this bed got the chili flake treatment here because I definitely want to be eating the last of the lettuces that the raccoons left for me. This cauliflower might actually happen now that the raccoons aren't messing with it anymore because they are getting a nose full of chili flakes. But yeah, this bed, another success. I'm very happy to see that everything's hanging in quite nicely there. So there's one more update and that is the container potatoes. So here are the containers and we'll just go ahead and dig through one of them. Just try to be careful. Oh, okay, there it is. So here's the soil line. Let me get a little closer. Here's the soil. This is the straw that we buried it in. And here's one of the potato sprouts. So it's literally a, maybe a half inch away from the surface of breaking through to the light. So I'm happy to see that. Basically, everything is alive. It is growing, especially the tomatoes have grown quite a lot. That bed got trolled by raccoons, but otherwise uh, things are looking good. So that's the two week update. Let me know if you guys want to see this again. This wasn't the most dramatic difference, but at least I'm able to show you guys some of the problems that might happen along the way, like the raccoons that destroyed that bed back there. 
everything else is looking really wonderful and they've put on a ton of growth and I'm very happy to see it. So any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll see you guys next time.